Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In. Tonight, I'm recapping Tabletop Bellhop Live Episode 25, Blue Plate Special. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that hit our tabletop in the last week. Ever since I taught Sean how to play Race for the Galaxy at our Gaming in the New Year party, the two of us have been playing a ton of the game on Board Game Arena. We started off simple with just the core game, and have since added the first two expansions. Now, while Board Game Arena isn't great for learning games like Race for the Galaxy, it is great for playing with people who already know the game. Our Friday Night Gloomhaven stream went well, though we did fail the scenario we attempted. I do think this is partly my fault. Um, all of us have gotten more into role-playing our characters, and when there was an elemental portal to jump through, I just couldn't help myself, and the rest of the party followed through. So now we're licking our wounds from the defeat. I do admit that going back to town to level up first is probably the better choice, and that's what we're going to be doing next week. We'll be going back to Gloomhaven, and then we are returning to the elemental plane to give it another shot. Now remember, you can join us every Friday night at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop and watch us stream our Gloomhaven games live. Now after we finished Gloomhaven, and since we had all the streaming equipment already set up, we decided to stream a teach and play of Gizmos. I was the first time playing for my wife as well as the other two players who play Gloomhaven with us. It went well, but the cards were really hard to see on the camera, so we're going to try something new with two cameras for our next stream. Saturday, Deanna and I went to a tabletop game night at one of the local game stores and got in three more games. First up was more gizmos. I am really digging gizmos. At this point, I think I can safely say it's become my favorite filler engine builder game. Now, I know there's a lot of love out there for Splendor, but for me, I'm going to pick Gizmos over Splendor every time. Now, one tip I did learn about Gizmos, especially when teaching it, is that you should always play twice. While the mechanics in the game are not hard to learn, it's the interactions of the various Gizmos that you've built during the game that are much easier to grasp once you've actually seen it in play. After Gizmos, we played a three-player game of Terraforming Mars using the Prelude expansion. I was excited about this because I got Prelude for Christmas, and this was my first time using it. So far, I like it. Prelude adds five more corporations, eight more project cards, and those just get mixed in with the normal cards. There's no reason I can see to ever remove them. The big addition that Prelude adds is 35 new Prelude cards. Now, at the start of the game, each player gets four of these and keeps two. Each of these cards kickstarts the game by giving each player some starting tags, resources, and resource production. Now, I was a little worried Prelude may make the game too short, but I didn't find that after this one play. Up next, we managed to squeeze in a really quick learning game of Dinosaur Island. This I got recently as the Kickstarter Extreme Edition. Now, I've only played this very quick learning game, and it was only with two players, so I really want to save my thoughts on the game uh, for when I've played more with more people and more uh, a longer game. But I will say one thing right now. Wow, does this game take up a lot of space, and it has a fairly long setup time. So just a heads up, you're going to need a fairly big table. Like, even playing two players, we almost ran out of room. Now, here comes to the highlight of last week. That was Sunday. Sunday, I got to sit down at the table and have my 11-year-old daughter teach me a game. Her copy of Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Uh, this is one of those proud dad moments, right? The first time your kid teaches you a game themselves, one of their games. That was fantastic. I do enjoy the game. It was pretty simple. It's a, it's, it's a basic deck builder that does a really good job of capturing the feel of the wizarding world. We've only played through book one and two so far, and I enjoyed it. But more importantly, uh, my daughter, Big G, seems to really dig it and really enjoy the game. Now, my podcast co-host, Sean, also got in a game of Hogwarts with his family, and he has a warning for everyone. This game may start off simple, 
But when you get to book five, things really ramp up. Supposedly there's one card that just is a game changer. He's been stuck there for a couple games. He tried again in this past week and his family failed again. He also had a tip for people playing the game, which was that someone at the table played Neville. Now, he didn't tell me why. He didn't want to spoil anything. But if you do have less than four players, he recommends at least one of them play the Neville character. Now, Sean and I played the Duke way back at our launch party, and he really enjoyed it. At the time, though, he noted that his chess-loving son would probably love this game. So he ordered a copy on Amazon, and after months of waiting for it to show up, he got his new copy of the New Lords Edition. Uh, and he got in a couple plays, and I am very happy to say that the game was a huge hit. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the Lord's Edition, it includes the original game and the Arthurian expansion in one box, which does seem like an improvement to me overall from the base game, though Sean did warrant of a slightly warped board. During our Hindsight Foresight New Year's episode, I talked about how one of my gaming resolutions for the year was to seriously reduce my pile of shame. Or I should say piles of shame. Actually, I could probably build a fort of shame at this point. Now, what do I mean by pile of shame? What I am talking about is that collection of games you spent your hard-earned gaming budget on, but still haven't played. Those games you rushed out to buy or kickstarted and were so excited about. Or those games you bought on a whim due to a good sale or an impulse buy because you're at the local game store. Now these include the games you bought last weekend and that game you've owned for three years but still haven't played. I'm looking at you, Shafosa. So one of the things I'd like to do in 2019 is greatly reduce my pile piles of shame. A big help towards keeping your goals is finding a way to hold yourself accountable and what better way to do this than to announce the goal and talk about your progress to the entire internet. To that end, we're going to use the hashtag less shame more game, pound hashtag less shame more game. Anytime I'm talking about getting games off my pile of shame, I'm going to use that hashtag and I welcome all of you to do the same. Let's all join in on this quest and get those unplayed games played. So here's a little check-in right now. Where are we at? Well, if you head over to the tabletopbellhot.com website, you can find a blog post from January 5th where I list all the games and expansions in my pile of shame. You've got the entire list there if anyone wants to check it out. At that point, there were 79 different games in the list. Since then, I played three of them, which got me down to 76, but then I had a birthday and I got four new games. So right now, that pile is at 80 games. And yes, I know, it's shameful. We are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. This week on Ask the Bellhop, we've got a two-for-one special on food-related questions. Order up. Drew Sanderson asks, Game night food etiquette, how important is it? Thanks for the question, Drew. I've got mixed feelings about food and gaming. While I love food, I am the big dude behind the Big Dude Likes Food blog. And I, as everyone listening and watching knows, loves games... I prefer to keep those two loves separate for the most part. I prefer that everyone eat before or after the game. Um, I'm all for everyone meeting up before the game to share a meal. I think that's a great way to get all the chit chat out of the way so that when you're sitting down to play, you can just get going right away. And I'm not a big fan of eating while playing. That said, we do sometimes have snacks at the table and for big events like our gaming in the new year party, we do order in food. I also know that combining food with gaming is very popular. So here are some of my thoughts on properly combining food and game night. First up, pick the right foods. Some foods just go better with games than others. You want to avoid greasy, powdery, saucy, sticky foods. And be really careful with those beverages. You don't want anything that's going to get on a player's hands and then get from those hands onto your game components. Now this goes for meals as well as snacks. Save those cheesy Doritos and wings for some other occasion. Now if you do plan on eating while you play, make sure people can do that. The type of foods you want are finger foods or stuff that can fit on a napkin or a small plate. Something that only ties up one hand and doesn't require putting a large plate down on the table getting in the way of playing. 
The other thing to consider while choosing foods is who will be eating it. Think of dietary restrictions. Is your friend on the keto diet, is one of your players a vegan? Do you have someone with milk allergies or are you like me and just can't stand mushrooms? Think to ask for this stuff ahead of time while you're planning the meals. And if you can't do that, make sure you have a variety of options available for your players. Even when choosing the most game-friendly foods, accidents will happen. So the other thing you want to do is protect those games. Sleeve your cards. Uh, consider picking up a laminator. You can get them dirt cheap now, and they are great for protecting things like character sheets, player boards, summary sheets, player handouts. The other thing to look at is the boards themselves, your meeples and your components, you can look into spray varnish for that. One heads up, we do not recommend Tester's Dull Coat. It has been, it is known to yellow over time. So the next step is having a food friendly game space. So this is about your game room or where you're playing your games. You wanna have coasters for drinks, preferably the kind that have a lip. Now this isn't necessarily just for spills, but also if you have cold beverages in a warm room, you're going to get condensation. You're gonna get sweat on your pop cans, for example. Make sure you have paper towels, napkins on hand uh, for those inevitable spills and dirty fingers. Make sure there's an easy to access garbage bin or bag. You don't want people squirreling food garbage on your game shelves. Trust me, I know from experience. Now the biggest tip in this place is to use side tables. We use wooden folding tables or TV trays. We put three to four of these around the main table and insist on people use them for their food and snacks. This way if something does spill, it will only get on the table and maybe your game room floor. Order up. Ivan Sorensen asks, what is the best way to organize the food run so it doesn't cut into game time? Planning, planning, planning. Plan ahead before the game night. Make sure everyone showing up is on the same page. People should know if there's going to be a meal or snack, what kind of food it will be, and what time things are going to be served. People need to know if they will need to bring money and how much uh, money to bring, and the person ordering the food needs to know who's in and who's out, and potentially what everyone wants. You don't want to kill half an hour or more game time having to stop and have the so what do you want to eat conversation. Now personally, I prefer to have someone deliver food on game night. Almost every place that delivers will do it for you at a set time as long as you call enough in advance. If you are instead picking stuff up, again, make it happen at a set time. Call enough in advance to say, hey, we want to pick this up for seven. Don't wait till you're hungry. Now, nowadays, another option is skip the dishes or Uber Eats. And what's cool about this is you can open up the app, pass it around to your friends, and they can all just put in their orders. Really cool way of doing things and welcome to the future. Now, you're doing all this planning so you can plan your gaming around the food. So if your game night starts at 5 and food's going to be there at 7, you know you have two hours to game. So you fit in two one-hour games or one two-hour game, then you take a break and eat. Now, I've noted before, I don't like to play and eat at the same time. So for me, when the food shows up, that's when you take a break. I find these breaks help break up a long event. They give everyone a chance to relax, use the washroom, get a new drink, go out for a smoke, check in with family, or catch up on their Twitter feed. It's also a great mental break if you're playing heavier games, or a good cool down period if you're playing something intense, uh, especially role playing games. Now getting back to the original topic of etiquette. All the rules for eating with other humans apply here. Doesn't change things that it's game night. Be courteous, don't hog food, bring money you know, if you know there's a chance you're going to be splitting. Basically, all the rules for vi visiting a friend or family for dinner apply as well to game night. Not being cool about food is a really good way to make sure you aren't invited to future events. So those are my thoughts on combining food and gaming. I do have one more tip, one way to kick it up a notch and level up your game night. Tie everything together. Pick a theme and find food and games that fit the theme and maybe some background music too. Like, how cool would it be to have a Japanese-themed game night where the pile of games includes Takedo, Takenoko, Shogun, and Yido? A night filled with Kurosawa soundtracks playing quietly in the background. And uh, midway through the night, you pause and sit down and have some Shio ramen before finishing up with the rest of the games. I'm up for that night anytime. 
Do you have a gaming or game night question you would like us to tackle in the future, uh, in a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop for an easy-to-use web form and many other ways to get in touch. We record a new episode of Tabletop Bellhop Live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and we would love it if you joined us in the lobby, our live chat room. The edited podcast version of that live show gets released every Tuesday, and you can find it on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Tabletop Bellhop, or on your podcatcher under the Tabletop Bellhop Live. If you enjoy the content we're providing, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash Tabletop Bellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of T Express Check-In. You can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop One Word, or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here, and check out our latest video by clicking over here. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night, and game on.